Hi, thanks for joining me today. My name is Jennifer House. I'm a registered dietitian from First Step Nutrition. And today we're talking about pesticides and fruits and vegetables and whether that's safe for you and your family. So if you're here on the replay, give me a little wave or say hi in the comments. And my motivation or reason for doing this is to help share evidence-based information on nutrition and farming because I see so much of fear and misinformation out there on the internet and you know words like toxic or dirty are used all the time to describe our food and I just want to dispel some myths and help to ease your mind about the foods you feed your family. So today I'm going to cover briefly what pesticides are, how they're used and regulated in Canada, as well as you know how much is actually on our food and is this safe. And I'm also going to demonstrate some recipes at the end with strawberries from, um, from Farm to Food Cookbook. So to start with very briefly, what are pesticides? There are three types. Um, the first is called insecticides, which prevent a crop from being destroyed by insects. There are fungicides, which help protect a crop against fungus. And some of the fungus that grow on certain crops, like wheat or peanuts, can actually be dangerous to humans, like mycotoxins, so we don't want those. And there's also herbicides, which of course um, prevent against weeds, which can compete with crops for light and water. Okay, so how are pesticides developed and regulated in Canada? So there's a division of Health Canada's um, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which is called the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, that's in charge of um, kind of developing and approving new pesticides. And it employs over 300 scientists, and it can take up to 10 years for a pesticide to be approved and that's because it has to go through over 200 studies to make sure it's safe for both the environment um, as well as people at all ages and stages of life. And the standards are very strict. So the usage standards are between 100 to 1000 times lower than could potentially um, you know, cause any toxicity and that's if this product were consumed over the course of an entire lifetime. So they're quite stringent, which is great. And how do farmers use pesticides? So I did write on my blog, which I'll share below this if you want more information or prefer reading, but looked at apples as an example. So over 40 varieties of apples are grown in Canada. Um, you know, they're one of our favorite fruits in my family. We can get them year round and, you know, easy for, for kids to eat. And not all, you know, conventional farmers use pesticides. They use a variety of ways to manage pests and weeds. But if they do um, are you know, using pesticides, that there is a reason for it. And um, they certainly do work. So if apple farmers, for example, didn't use pesticides in Canada, there would be 50% fewer apples on the market, which of course means a lot of increased waste, means increased work for the farmer, increased decreased income for the farmer, and then the price of the produce or apples would be significantly more for the consumer or you. Um, so if crop, you know, plant science were not used, it's estimated that produce would cost us 47% more than it does currently, which would be about $4,000 for the average Canadian family. So it's a significant savings for both farmers and consumers. But I know for some of us, um, you know, we wonder, okay, maybe it's cheaper, but is it worth it? Are there, you know, negative health effects on my family of, you know, using these pesticides on crops? So the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in Canada does monitor this. They have a national chemical residue monitoring program and they set maximum residue limits for the pesticides on produce. And again, these are very stringent. Um, they're set way below any level that would cause any health concerns, including all members of the population, including pregnant women and infants. And in the States, um, Amer for those Americans, the United States Department of Agriculture every year does test, and most recently, their most recent test found that 99, over 99% 99 of produce have pesticide residue levels well below the safety tolerance levels. And their conclusion was that um, pesticide residues do not pose a safety concern for U.S. food. So that's good news as well. And something that's important to note is that even though pesticides may be detected on uh, produce does not mean that it's at a dangerous level. 
our technology is so sophisticated that we can detect the amount of pesticide that would be equivalent to one drop of water in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. So we can detect very minute amounts. And these are, you know, levels far below any possible, you know, concentration that has been shown to cause harm in humans. And, uh, like, the dose essentially makes a poison, right? <laughs> and that really applies to everything, including water. And other pesticides, um, you know, while they can be harmful to weeds and insects, don't affect humans at all. But, okay, what about the Dirty Dozen? A lot of you have probably heard of the Environmental Working Group's Dirty Dozen list, which re is released every year. <laughs> it came out recently. And um, what the Environmental Working Group does is they test conventionally grown produce, and those that have the most pesticides on them, they put on their dirty list. And those that have the least, they're put on their clean list. And the EWG warns consumers to beware of pesticides on fruits and vegetables which I think um, is really sad for a number of reasons. Um, one, because, like I mentioned earlier, just because the pesticide can be detected doesn't mean that it's at a dangerous level for humans. Um, so apples and strawberries, apples and strawberries usually top their list, and these are two of my kids' favorite fruits. And what they don't mention is that a child could eat 181 servings of strawberries a day and 340 <laughs> servings of apples per day before I know any impact from pesticide residue and that's using the highest pesticide residue ever recorded. So I wanted to um, share my screen with you for a minute here and show you how you can take a look at that yourself. So this is a website safefruitsandveggies.com. It's by um, the Alliance of Food and Farming, and they have lots of great information on this website, and you can also scroll down so they have a pesticide residue calculator. So that's where I got these numbers from. And you can do this for a man, woman, teen. If we look at a child, what do we want to look at? Peaches. So it calculates how many servings of peaches a child could consume in a day without any effect if the peaches have the highest pesticide residue recorded for peaches by the United States Department of Agriculture, and that's 1,890. So, you know, obviously not realistic for your child to eat that many peaches in a day. And another interesting, um, you know, thing about this dirty dozen list is the do not look at tests on organic produce. So did you know, a lot of people don't know from what I can see on the internet is that organic farmers are allowed to use pesticides too. So organic produce does not mean pesticide free. They're allowed to use natural, so they have a big list of pesticides that are allowed on organic um, crops and these are natural. And um, like I always like to say natural doesn't necessarily you know, means safe either. We think natural and we think, oh, that must be safe. But um, again, the dose, the dose makes a toxin. And in some cases, more of the natural pesticide needs to be applied to accomplish the same effect that a smaller amount of the synthetic pesticide needs. So I'm not trying to bash organic produce at all, but this is something that I think is not well known by people is that organic farms can use pesticides as well. And the Dirty Dozen doesn't test organic produce. Um, they just kind of, you know, give us the feeling that it's safer, but they certainly don't prove it. And I'd always thought that there have been research studies that show people who consume organic have lower levels of pesticides in the urine. But what I've discovered is that these studies, again, don't look at organic produce. They don't test um, the natural, they don't test for the natural pesticides that are allowed to be used on organic produce. They just test for the synthetic pesticides that are allowed in you know, conventional produce. So, you know, of course the studies show that those people consuming organics have lower levels of pesticides in the urine because they don't test for the pesticides that are being used <laughs> to grow the organic food. So it uh, can be a little bit misleading. And again, if you prefer to buy organic um, and you can afford it, you know, no problem there. I just want people to eat more fruits and vegetables, period, no matter what kind. I just want, um, you know, your decisions to be made from an educated point of view instead of based out of fear. Because what um, you know we've been seeing is decreased fruit and vegetable intake. Um, there was a study in BC that be found between 2004 and 2015 produce intake decreased by 13% in Canadians, 
And not that that's just because of confusion and fear. Of course, prices is increasing. There's other pieces of that puzzle. But there have been other surveys that have found, you know, people, some people can't afford organic and then they're confused. They may be fearful of conventional products, so they just don't buy it and they just eat less, which is really unfortunate because the research is very clear that fruits and vegetables have great, you know, health benefits. They decrease our risk for chronic diseases like cancer, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. Um, and there was another quick study I wanted to share with you here. Here we go. So this was in the Food and Chemical Toxicology Journal. And they estimated that if half of the U.S. population consumed just one more serving of produce per day, 20,000 cases of cancer would be prevented. The study also analyzed, you know, the potential cancer risk from pesticides on produce, um, which they estimated as 10 per year. So, you know, 20,000 saved by increased fruit and vegetable consumption versus 10 potentially caused by, you know, consuming pesticides. And their conclusion was the overwhelming difference between benefit and risk estimates provides confidence that consumers should not be concerned about cancer risks from consuming conventionally grown fruits and vegetables. So I just want to, you know, help dispel some of the myths and some of the fear around eating conventionally grown produce and want you to feel confident in feeding your family more fruits and vegetables, whether, you know, it's local, whether it's organic, whether it's conventional and not to have to worry about that. So I have one more thing I wanted to share with you guys, which is the From Farm to Food Cookbook, A Seasonal Journey, and I'll share how to get it in a minute, I just wanted to um, demo a recipe for you. I'll lower this so you can see what I'm doing. So the cookbook breaks each um, season down and provides information on different Canadian crops and how they're grown and on the health benefits of the crops. So the one I was gonna share is called White Fish with Fresh Cut Strawberry and Avocado Salsa. Because I know we're always looking for ways to increase fish and fish recipes seem to be a struggle to find for most people. And I thought this sounded delicious. So we take two uh, cups of strawberries, a little bit of lime juice, and I've cut everything up so you guys don't have to watch me chop. Um, some jalapeno, which, you know, if you're feeding this to your kids and they really don't like spicy, you could just leave that out. A little bit of red onion cilantro, which I love. I know some people don't love cilantro, but it's one of my faves. And then you can mix this up and you can keep it in the fridge. And then just before you serve it, um, so it doesn't go too brown, you can put on some avocado. I just happen to have a perfectly ripe avocado, which seems to be rare. So I think this would, recipe would be great on um, chicken too, probably even just with chips, but it'd be great on fish. So I'm going to give that a try tonight and it also looks beautiful as well. I ended up buying the strawberries were on sale, conventionally grown strawberries, so I bought a bunch at the grocery store. So I'm also going to try this very fresh smoothie. It has some tofu in it, which is great. Smoothies are awesome for adding in extra nutrition like that, so adding some extra protein with the tofu. And I've tried a few others, so I tried the grilled carrot and avocado salad with maple Dijon dressing the other night to give to a friend for dinner. It's not quite warm enough here to grill, so I actually roasted the, the carrots, but I love roasting veggies. It brings out their natural sweetness. And I've also tried the beet, bocconcini, and tomato lentil salad in a kick mustard vinaigrette. I love uh, beets. Love beets and lentils. Lentils are another great Canadian crop, and the mustard too. So I'm just going to show you guys where you can get your own copy of this cookbook if you like. You can visit the Crop Life Canada website, croplife.ca and right here on the homepage you can order your pdf copy of the cookbook well download it or order a hard copy if you want and this website also has lots of great information on plant science learning more about food as well as the environment and health so thanks for joining me today if you have any questions about anything i talked about please feel free to post below i'm happy to share you know certain research or more information with you guys and please feel free to share this with anybody you think would find it interesting thanks for being here today and we'll see you soon